Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to cup number five of Lowell Observatory's Cosmic Coffee Series here on Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. Um, thanks for joining us, and we're, we've got a really interesting program for you uh, today. We're going to start, as always, by giving a quick shout out to one of our local coffee shops here in Flagstaff. Actually, I can't tell you to go um, get some of their stuff, uh, even through a takeout, because they're completely closed right now in response to the COVID-19 crisis, but this is, is one of our shops with two locations, Late for the Train Coffee. Uh, you, if you're local, you probably know about them down on San Francisco and out on Fort Valley. Uh, we picked them uh, today because one of their blends is the so-called Dark Sky Mocha, and today's show is all about dark skies. Um, if you tuned into our live stream uh, last night about Earth Day, we talked a little bit about this, and I mentioned this morning's show. I'm very happy this morning to be joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Ruskin Hartley, who is the director of the International Dark Sky Association. And he's uh, graciously taken some time to be with us here this morning and just talk about the, the IDA and all things uh, dark skies here on this week when we celebrate the earth and its natural resources. So welcome Ruskin, Ruskin thanks for being with us. And I thought maybe we, yeah, maybe we can start um, with uh, sort of the, the intro picture that's up here on the live stream showing the International Dark Sky Association and Dark Sky Week. So tell us a little bit about the IDA and its mission and philosophy and what you're doing for this uh, Dark Sky Week. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for bringing us on during International Dark Sky Week. It's, it's, it's great to come and join you. Uh, our neighbors up north up here in Arizona. Um, so the International Dark Sky Association, our mission is pretty simple. Um, we're all about protecting the night from light pollution. Uh, and, and really, that's our reason to be. And we, we were founded 30 years ago, actually, by an amateur and a professional astronomer here in Tucson, Arizona. But since then, we've really grown into a much more broad-based movement that cuts across many dimensions of, of, of what it takes to protect the night from light pollution. And so every year during International Dark Sky Week, for about the last decade, uh, we have really helped work with our network of chapters and advocates and supporters around the world to really celebrate the night and its, its many wonderful values and really introduce people to Now, traditionally, this would have been taking place during scar parties and people coming together. And clearly this year um, with, with the COVID-19 pandemic, that's not happening. But actually, it's presented an incredible opportunity for us to go virtual and go global. So this week during International Dark Sky Week, we have put together in the last three weeks uh, a series of presentations and discussions with probably 40 or 50 leading experts from around the world, covering up everything from the heritage of dark skies in Australia to the impact of light pollution on, on wildlife in, in, in cities and communities. Um, you can go online, idsw.darksky.org and follow along. Great. And, and of course, you know, we've likewise been doing the same thing, taking our programs increasingly digital to stay in touch with people online. That's that's, of course, what this is all about this morning. So, yeah, you mentioned uh, the steady growth and sort of proliferation of light pollution. And we are at kind of a watershed moment in terms of the gradual loss of the night sky. So let's talk about that a bit. I'm going to put up a uh, an image here from a recently published atlas by uh, Fabio Falchi and collaborators um, that gives an idea of just how the night sky is disappearing. Yeah, I mean, just th this is really an iconic image. I think, you know, I think you're showing an image of basically North America. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what you're seeing is you know, the, the dark spots are the dark spots. Those are the dark, dark refuges, the dark reserves. And as you go through the blues and greens and reds, yellows and reds and all things of the whites, what you're getting, you're getting a, a sky that's really polluted with millions of unshielded and carelessly uh, deployed uh, electric lights being put out uh, at night. And in fact, when you get to the, the uh, reds and the whites, essentially you've lost any semblance of, of natural night. You know, basically, there is, you're in perpetual twilight in those areas. This is not just a phenomenon in North America, but it is a phenomenon around the world. In fact, we estimate based upon this data and other studies that um, something like 80% of the people in the world today can no longer see the Milky Way when they look up. At some estimates, it might be as much as 99% of people in, in North America uh, and Europe. Um, as critical, as, as important, light pollution is continuing to grow. 
it's actually outstripping population growth. Globally, it's grown at least 2% a year, and in some countries, it's grown as rapidly as 10% a year, uh, with a myriad of consequences that, that I know we'll be talking about later. Yeah, exactly. And I can certainly tell you, uh, back when we were still open and had lots of visitors here, you know, it's always fun to come do the meet and astronomer nights and sort of point out the Milky Way with your laser pointer. And it's amazing how many folks just honestly have no idea what it is because they've never seen it. And you know, certainly if you've been in any of these uh, yellow and red areas, I mean, we well know you can only see a small number of the, the brightest stars and that's all that's left. There's a great story that some people might have heard from, I think it was in Los Angeles during the Logan Creator earthquake, I think that was 94 maybe. And um, the lights went out over a large swath of the city and, and the, the, the police of the emergency services started getting calls about what is that thing in the sky? And it was the Milky Way, but people had no idea, they, they'd never seen it. it, it literally at the, at the speed of light, as the power went off, they went from being able to see maybe a dozen of the brightest objects, the brightest stars and, and in the sky above the city of Los Angeles to seeing thousands. Yes. Uh, and that was a transformative experience for some people. And others, you know, they're like, my goodness, what is that? Yeah, I, I was actually in uh, Los Angeles for uh, an event in January. And, you know, walking over in the evening to, to give my talk for this group, I was kind of looking up and basically the, the faintest thing I could see was Orion's belt. And, you know, and, and the brightest thing, of course, all the planes going into LAX, of course. Um, so that, yeah, so that, that means you're seeing down to about second magnitude stars, which is really, uh, which is not, not a lot. Um, so, so yeah, light poll pollution is growing. And of course, here at, at Lowell, we uh, worry about it principally from an astronomical context. But uh, you mentioned before, that it goes well beyond astronomy. And so I'm gonna put up, up this slide. I, I pulled a couple of things uh, off the internet and actually one out of my inbox. There's uh, some links here from a website about sea turtles uh, from a, a Chicago Building Manufacturers Association talking about migratory birds. And then at the bottom, I just have a screen capture from an email uh, I get, I get this email every couple of years. I've been participating in this cancer prevention study and in the, the most recent iteration of it where they ask you about your, uh, your health and your lifestyle and clearly they're trying to understand cancer risk factors, they've added this whole long section about my daily exposure to light and, and my, you know, what the, the nighttime environment that I'm in is like when I'm asleep. So this has a lot of broad implications, clearly. Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly if you look at a long arc of this, it was certainly the astronomers who first took note of, of light pollution, so the astronomical light pollution, the kind of classic sky glow, impairing their ability to look into the deepest reaches of, of, of the universe. But what we have learned over the last 20 or 30 years is, is really light pollution impacts every living thing. And it, it makes sense when you think about it. We, you know, every living thing on the planet, unless you live in the deepest, darkest cave, essentially grew up under an environment with dark nights and, and light, bright, sunny days, and the brightest thing at night was the full moon. So that was the that was what we were in tune to, we were in train to. A um, hundred years ago, that started to change, where in electric light, electric light became ubiquitous, essentially, and, and so it spread, and it continues to spread rapidly across the, the globe with a, a myriad of, of effects. Um, in terms of wildlife, um, particularly given this is you know, yesterday was Earth Day, so there's a lot of discussions about the impact of artificial light, electric light at night on, on wildlife. Basically, every species that has been studied has shown an effect, generally a, a, a detrimental effect. Mm -hmm. um, some of the classic examples are birds being drawn off their migratory paths into cities, uh, flying around in brightly lit um, building, you see nicely in the photos of the, the laser beam, the light shooting out the top of the Luxor pyramid and the birds uh, spiraling in that, essentially they're, they're trapped, they're caught, or the birds hitting the buildings, like, you know, as you're indicating there in your, uh, about the Lights Out program in Chicago, those, those migratory birds, and the estimates are hundreds of millions of birds each year are d die as a result of light pollution. We also learned last year about um, the insect apocalypse, scientists are really concerned about the um, rapid decline of insects around the world. Mm -hmm. There's a myriad of causes, habitat loss, 
pesticides, you know, many, many challenging issues to solve. One they also put a spotlight on is light. And one of the reasons they put it on, that is that it's one of the ones that we can solve. It's, it's relatively simple to solve and address uh, light pollution. More and more, we're also learning about the impact that light has on human health. Um, and it's not just the light at night. It's, it's good that they're talking about the, your environment when you're sleeping. What are you doing at night? And what are we learning from sleep researchers is, is we're really changing our exposure to light in two fundamental ways. So, so one is during the day, we tend to spend time indoors where it's not very bright compared to a natural sunny day. And at night, we're, if we're indoors, we tend to be exposed to screens and LED lights. And, and so we're just changing it on, on both ends. And then there's no, no wonder, again, we're animals like anything else, that it's disrupting our circadian rhythm. In, in fact, those short wave -like conditions are suppressing the production of melatonin, which, as many people know, is kind of known as the, the sleep hormone, and is actually delaying the onset of sleep for many people. Um, and then has knock-on effects in terms of, uh, of cancer and obesity and diabetes and many other health issues. Right, and I think thus, as, as you know, the medical community is clearly becoming more attuned to this and, and starting to try to collect the data to better understand just what these, these effects are. So this is certainly a very broad-based problem, and um, the, I think the next thing we're going to do is, is move into talking about you know, what steps, what specific things communities do to um, address dark sky management. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick detour. Uh, we do, did have a, a question that's come in on the YouTube feed that I want to respond to. I, I entirely expected this would come up. We're talking about uh, ground-based light pollution here. Um, uh, the person asked if uh, we've been involved at all on um, the space-based side with the proliferation of large satellite constellations. And um, we can certainly get into that at greater length, maybe in the concluding Q&A if people want. But the short answer is, yes, we absolutely have. Um, uh, Ruskin and I both, um, I'm the chair of the American Astronomical Society's Standing Committee on, on Light Pollution and, and Space Debris. We've been working directly uh, with SpaceX um, which is, uh, they are on record saying that they don't want to harm astronomy um, and they don't want to light up the night sky. So we are working with them on ways to mitigate the brightness of those satellites. Ruskin and I were both at the society meeting in January where we actually met with some SpaceX folks. Yeah, and, and so IDA likewise is similarly concerned and, and not just the astronomical perspective. Now we're concerned about the, the individual who might have one opportunity in their life to go out to a true dark sky site and, and what are they going to see? Are they going to see uh, the Milky Way in the cosmos or are they going to see a train of satellites going over? Now, our, our belief, our, our commitment is that the night sky is a, is a shared resource um, that is really the ultimate public good um, and it shouldn't be, you know, any one individual shouldn't be allowed to despoil that. Um, so we're working um, with our community of advocates around the world on this issue, both to try to understand and assess the, the impact that it's currently have, but also trying to identify uh, what are the policy and regulatory changes that need to happen, both at the sort of international treaty level and also at the national level, so that we can recognize the, the value uh, of a dark, un unimpeded sky. Right, and entirely agreed. And and I think you know this this shared resource. Uh, point you made is certainly demonstrated, for instance, by the Park Service, which has kind of adopted, you know, the natural night sky or interpreting the sky as one of the resources for humanity that it is charged to protect. And so you see a lot of uh, the parks and monuments acquiring this, uh, you know, dark sky status from the IDA. All right. So let's, um, let's talk about, um, I often talk about, um, dark sky protection in terms of kind of being a three-legged stool. And I've got a slide here with some uh, some images showing the three legs of that stool. And in particular, as we implement them here in Flagstaff, which was the first city in the world to receive IDA dark sky community designation back in 2001. And so, yeah, Ruskin, maybe you can say a bit about, about these essential components. Yeah, so I think we would, Looks like your sort of three-legged school tool is kind of down at the level of kind of the city. Kind of, I'd like maybe to step back as, as we think about dark sky protection. There's also kind of a 
a three-legged stool, simply like this sort of metaphors, uh, and it really starts from um, raising awareness. You know, light pollution is a, an environmental issue that most people are unaware of. And case in point, I've worked in the conservation community for 20 years and never really thought about it until I joined IGA just over a year ago. So it really starts with raising awareness both of the value of the light um, and that light pollution is a, a, a urgent threat to those values that we can actually solve. Um, like many other issues. So that, that's the first leg of the stool. Mm -hmm. uh, the second leg of the stool for us is really about protecting dark sky places. Um, so that map that you pulled up earlier, those those dark, core dark sky reserves, like it, we have a great program, our International Dark Sky Places Program, where we recognize the land management practices and the light management practices of, of primarily public agencies, park services, and others around the world, and we certify those practices. And we now have about... Um, well over 100 places certified, including the Grand Canyon joined last year, uh, protecting over over 100,000 square kilometers of dark places, dark reserves around the world. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's critically important that we protect those dark places. Now, the third leg of the stool is really where we're going to be talking about now, Jeff, which, which is really these dark places are not the sources of light pollution. The, the light is coming from the cities and communities that we live in. And really, that's the third area that we need to be focused on, is like coming up with smart solutions so that people can um, use light more responsibly. You know, we, we, we're, we're called the Dark Sky Association, not the Dark Ground Association. Yep. So places where you need a dark ground, or shine the light into a wide right reserve, for instance. But it's not about having no light. It's about having responsible use of light. And, and really, um, we recently came up uh, with a set of, Pretty simple principles, five principles for responsible lighting that actually have been endorsed jointly by the boards of IDA and actually the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America, the, the leading mm -hmm. professional body of lighting engineers. And they're pretty simple um, and they apply to any scale from, from a home to a municipality to even a nation. And it starts with put light where it's needed. You know, if you don't need a light, don't put it in. The, the, arguably, the only dark sky friendly light is the one that's never put in. Once you make the decision to put a light in, because maybe there's some steps or stairs or there's access or egress that you need to have access to at night, um, then you're really about managing the lit environment and reducing light pollution. And then you can do that by simple steps like making sure the light is pointed down, not up at the sky, um, by targeting and pointing it to where it's needed and not beyond. Don't shine it into your neighbor's yard, for instance, when you leave it on your steps or your driveway. Most probably, arguably, the one that has often commonly been overlooked is don't overlight. In, in the modern era of cheap LED technology, it's so easy to go and put a very bright bulb out with the assumption that more light is better. More light is not better. Better light, better quality light is better. So light at low levels. Right. And finally, really think about the spectrum. Think about the color characteristics of the light. And generally, you know, the astronomers know uh, a very narrow band <laughs> is great from an astronomical perspective because you can filter it out of your images. Um, as we transition to LED technology, um, we're more now looking at ways that we can manage the shorter wavelength emission, minimize that bluer violet end of the spectrum in favor of those warmer, uh, richer yep. colors. Yeah, and that, that certainly covers um, what's shown here on the slide. When you talk about you know, where do you implement light and and where, how do you not overlight um, the map of Flagstaff, as an example, at upper right there, um, shows the lighting zones within the city. And that is designed to manage the level of lighting that's permissible. And different zones have slightly different specifications. Then, as you point out, I really like the, the, the uh, you know, dark sky ordinance is not a dark ground ordinance. Um, and I use that all the time. And often, you know, a dark sky ordinance means a, a more safely and better lit ground because of sort of the upper left, for example, where all the fixtures are shielded and no light is being emitted above horizontal. That's that's one of the components. And then, um, of course, to your comments about spectrum, and we'll we'll talk about LEDs here in just a second. But at the bottom, uh, there's this image from the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition of different spectra. And as you point out, the two at the top are. Uh, the spectra of low pressure sodium and high pressure sodium and high pressure sodium is what's widely in use right now around the world. Low pressure sodium is actually now obsolete, although it is because of its extreme narrow band characteristics, kind of the, 
the gold standard or perhaps the amber standard for, for dark sky. Um, but then the, the two spectra at the bottom, as you mentioned, those are LEDs and it's, it's white LEDs and it's clear how much bluer and, and critically how much bro more broadband uh, emission they emit. And so let's, let's uh, oh there, and there's the, uh, the um, captions just to show you which is which. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, so here's some pictures of different types of LEDs. Um, uh, three of them by me, uh, one of them taken by your own John Barentine, who's a member of the IDA staff. These are pictures of white LED, um, white LEDs at the upper right with the blue knocked out. So it, it takes on this, this green character um, if it's a high temperature white, which I, I don't, I, I, I feel like I look a little bit like a zombie when I'm standing under one of them. So they're not, not as pleasant. But then there are these, these amber LEDs um, at the bottom. In, this is one is in Flagstaff, and I think this other one from John is uh, in Mesilla, New Mexico. It's, it's been, there's so much that goes into light and decisions around light, and a lot of it ultimately comes down to personal preferences and the preferences of the people. People tend to be drawn to those brighter, whiter colors often. There were some certainly like the, the warmer embers, and, and what that's lacking is a, a really an understanding of the, the, the full life cycle and full impact of those decisions. Now, when, when you're talking about putting an LED fixture in place. It used to be you change a light bulb every few years, but they burn out. Now, when you're putting a, a, a luminaire, a, a fixture in place, the, the life expectancies of those is 8, 10, 12, 20 years. So the decisions we're making about how we're light, lighting our environment today are going to be with us for, have a long term. They're going to be with us for um, 10, 20 years. Uh, and that's why it's so critically important that, that we have this this debate and this dialogue and really understand mm -hmm. the impact of those decisions and so the IDA's commitment is to make sure that, uh, that, that the creatures of the night and the people who enjoy a dark sky um, have a voice uh, in, in those decisions. And that's only why IDA recommends um, using the, the, the warmest, uh, lowest uh, Kelvin temperature fixtures uh, that, are, that, are possible, that are feasible in, in your city or community and, and clearly dealing, dealing with issues like shielding and whatnot. Down. And I'm pointing them down towards times. Right. And um, there, there are sort of there are two axes I think you can go there as you're implementing LED solutions. So at, at bottom left, you know, as Flagstaff is presently um, way, way down the road, and effectively we've arrived at, at conclusions on conversion of our streetlight system, for example, to LED. And we will be using predominantly the LEDs you see at lower left and some of the ones you see at lower right. These are the narrow band and phosphor converted amber LEDs, which are, you know, lumen for lumen, they will preserve the quality of the dark sky. Now, upper right, um, up, sorry, upper left is a white LED. Um, and as I understand, the solution in Tucson um, was to use both the much warmer, uh, lower temperature white LEDs, but even those will still increase the sky glow significantly over high pressure sodium. So you also took the, the whole lumen budget way down yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so these are two, I like to think of it almost like a recipe book. And anytime you're thinking about uh, the, the light levels, the intensity of the light you're putting out, you also need to be thinking about the spectra, spectral characteristics because the two work together. Right. Essentially, for human vision, we're very sensitive to that blue short wavelength. That's, as uh, my colleague Pete on staff, there's a little bit of blue that goes a long way. Yeah. Um, so uh, conversely, a, a lot of blue uh, looks very bright and glary as it shows up in that top left hand corner. So when Tucson, no, I think Flagstaff is a really interesting example. It's obviously a, a, a very progressive community there that is really centered and rooted in Lowell Observatory. And it's, it's really embraced uh, protecting the night sky for the purposes of, of astronomy. And that works in that community. Now, Tucson took a slightly different approach, as you mentioned, Jeff. So it, when it went about doing its uh, LED conversion, and most cities are doing this partly because the old fixtures are getting obsolescent, but they can be real energy savings as a result of this, which is really critical, obviously, as we deal with issues like climate change. But when Tucson looked at it, it said, look, we're not going to be single focus on just on that outcome of climate change. We want to make sure that we're also considering how we manage and actually reduce sky glow. We want to reduce the total quantity of short wavelength blue emissions that are being put out into the environment. And they designed a solution that enabled them to accomplish that 
uh, by choosing warmer LEDs. They weren't the caravan amber or the phosphor converted amber. They were, uh, they're a uh, 3000 K fixture. Um, they actually reduce the lumens, the, the amount of light that's being put out. Um, I think, I believe it, uh, at midnight now, they dim them down to about 60%. Our eyes are exquisitely sensitive. They respond, and in fact, most people have not noticed a difference. There have been very, very few complaints. Uh, it still appears to be sufficiently lit. It's certainly lit consistent with the industry recommendations um, from, from a safety perspective. But, but by managing those, the city's able to achieve its uh, it's cost savings, it's cli uh, climate target reductions, and mm -hmm. has reduced the short short wavelength emissions. And there's some indication that um, early indications, looking at sky glow at a distance, that there's been a reduction in sky glow as well. Yep, yep. I, I, that's a really good point you made. Um, how nobody's noticed, and there haven't been complaints. Um, I, I always, I often like to just offer up a thought experiment in, in trying to get people to, to think about creative solutions or think out of the box, you know, a, a thought experiment you could never implement, but just imagine, suppose across the entire state or the entire nation, you simply dimmed every single light equivalently by 10%. You know, it'd be, think about the amount of energy savings um, and, and, you know, relative to one light or another, nobody would be brighter or fainter and nobody would notice, right? Um, and, and, you know, that's not a doable thing, but it does show that it, you can think in ways that, that we actually can make changes that don't, um, you know, destroy the safe illumination of the ground or do weird things like that. It can be done if the community has the attention and the will to do it. Yeah, it means it starts with that awareness. It starts with awareness and it starts with kind of community support. And I really think that that's how where IGA has come in with our network of advocates and, and, and members around the world are really um, helping talk to their city officials, talk to their elected officials, talk to their neighbors or friends about both the value of the night and the steps that they can be taking as they're making these decisions that will have these lasting implications on their community. Right. Um, many people are not making them um, because they hate the night, <laughs> they're making them because they have a false set of assumptions and, and they're, they're, they're not sufficiently um, informed and educated about the, the, the implications of the decisions that they're making. Right. And this is um, I, I, one really good thing, I think, about the IDA International Dark Sky Places uh, or Dark Sky Community Program. And I was talking about this a bit at the end of our live stream last night. Um, you know, Flagstaff is one. We have several in Arizona now, right? Uh, Camp Verde, Sedona, um, and I, really importantly, Fountain Hills, right? Right on the edge of the Phoenix Metro. And the lesson there is to be an IDA dark sky community, you, you can be right next to a huge city if, if you've got the community commitment to good practice and I think maintaining ongoing awareness that you're talking about. Yeah, and that's really the distinction between our dark sky parks program and, and the community. The dark sky parks, it starts with having a dark sky. You know, you have to go out and take, you have to take sky quality measurements and you have to demonstrate that you're taking the steps to both educate people about it, but also protect it. Now, dark sky communities are a little different. You know, we love it when they do have dark skies. It's fabulous. But really, um, dark sky communities is about the intent, the community being intentional about managing its light to reduce light pollution. Um, and we're excited to see that grow. Um, and it, you know, Flagstaff was the first to kind of, um, and has been a leader in this for, for many years, but now we have a community of, I think, 70,000 people in Germany now. This is a dark sky community. So it's exciting to see this aspect of the work kind of take off uh, around the world. And um, there are, you know, I think there are some questions in the stream about sort of the, the, the economic benefits of, of better urban lighting. It would be great to, we'd love to partner with some economists to really dig into this. We, we know, for instance, our Dark Sky Places program and Colorado Plateau is generating millions and millions of dollars of economic impact to those communities on the Colorado Plateau, primarily through tourism um, over the course of the year. Yeah. You know, basically, if you're going out to see a dark sky, you're probably staying overnight rather than just doing a day trip to a place. So you're, you're staying in a hotel and you're you know, getting your food and having a cup of coffee in the morning. So there are real benefits to communities to do this. But we're also seeing the economic benefits to communities uh, who are looking at better lighting practices. You know, they save money because they're using less light, which costs money, it's pollution, it's waste. Um, right. But our hunch is that, um, and we've certainly been told, that people are starting to advertise communities as dark sky places as attractive places to come and live. 
that, that, because you know uh, the type of environment and the type of commitment to protecting the environment that the region has as represented through that uh, designation. Yeah, and you've actually, I, th I think you've addressed actually one of the questions that came in on the stream uh, from um, Ian McLennan, who works uh, a lot with Lowell. Hi, Ian. Um, who asked, can you comment on, on how to promote the economic benefits of better lighting? And I think you were just addressing some of that. Um, yeah, and I, I think the flip side, it also starts with, with um, really helping people understand, you kind of comes back to saying, more light does not equal better light. Um, if, if we're in a room together, I'd say like you know, put put up your hands if you, if you like if you know if you're driving around at night and you like those very bright, glary blue headlights coming your way. Um, no one likes that type of glare. Um, it shuts your pupils down. It doesn't make us safe. So people intuitively know that, but now we need to translate that to the built environment. Um, actually, yesterday IDA launched a, a new um, self a home assessment program, our dark sky friendly home assessment program. Um, aligned with the principles that are aligned, you can go around your home and um, take a look at what lights you have and, and complete a, a simple assessment. Um, note down any changes that need to be made. Maybe you need to put a motion sensor on a, a, a light you have that comes on when, when you come home um, at night. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you change out some bulbs to warmer bulbs. Um, and then once you complete it, you can, you can um, get self-certified and do your part uh, and share what you're doing with your city and your community kind of spread this from the bottom up. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, um, Kelly Hicks asks, um, how difficult would it be to switch out the nation's street lighting systems to more health-friendly options? What kind of logistics and costs would be involved? Uh, obviously a, a, a big task. <laughs> it's a great question. I mean, it, it, interesting, in a sense, we have been doing this. I mean, and that, that's the irony here. And, and in fact, it's an interesting congruence of a, a couple of events. I um, mean, clearly we're in, in the midst of probably a, a pretty serious economic downturn, a serious economic downturn at the moment. Um, last time the country faced something like this was like 2007, 2008. Um, and if you recall at that point, the Obama administration um, put out a program of kind of economic recovery afterwards. A lot of those investments were made in infrastructure, um, and they were looking for shovel-ready product projects that they could start putting money back into the economy and deliver things that had a, a lasting benefit. The administration was also focused on climate change, and at the same time, the technology of lighting had changed. And there were these new efficient LEDs. Um, they tended to be the bluer ones that we we're talking about earlier, these yeah. higher temperature ones. So that's where you get the efficiency at that point, ten to years ago. You were putting in four or five thousand K LEDs, and the com combination of those two events—the economic recovery, the investment in infrastructure, and the new LED technology—essentially meant that the nation did start changing its street lights now, but with a single focus on, on energy efficiency. So then the question is, like, how, how you know can we use this moment and they're talking about infrastructure methods now to get it right uh, with our new knowledge and with more efficient three thousand and twenty seven hundred K products? Um, if there is an infrastructure investment, I think we're better poised to do a change out and a, a retrofit that will have benefit to the environment uh, and the nice guy. Yes, yes. Th thanks, thanks. Great, great answer. And it's certainly true. You know, I think uh, going back to our pictures, um, I actually I measured the the ones at upper left. I think those were five thousands. Um, and you know, they're just. You know, I, I'm, I've read that where communities have installed those very high temperature ones, it's like the headlights you were talking about. Eventually, people are just like, you know, what are these things and and are asking for a, a change out to um, something lower. And then um, one more question at the moment. Um, Jim Davies. Hi, Jim. Um, Jim asks, can filters be put on LED lights to make them better? Uh, the answer is yes, you can filter them, and the picture at upper right is an example of a fairly high temperature white LED that's had a filter that's knocked out the blue and leaves kind of that green. There are other ways to do it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. This is less about the, the filters, but you can still buy street lights out there that you cannot install shields. So a shield is, is a little, um, maybe a bit of plastic or a bit of metal that, will, that you can install in a street light that will keep it from shining into... Um, into your bedroom window, for instance, mm -hmm. you can call the city and say, hey, can you shining on my property? Can you come and put a shield on? I mean, I think it's a tragedy that you can still buy um, 
a streetlight, the city can still specify a streetlight that you cannot install this year. Yep. So there, there are some simple changes that our cities can be doing. Like make sure you're specking a streetlight that you can install a shield. Make sure you're putting one that you can uh, retrofit or install a controller so that you can dim it down after midnight. So there, there are simple steps. And, and clearly something that, you know, if you can add a filter um, to protect more ecologically sensitive areas, then that would be great. Okay. Um, oh. Lots of familiar names here. David Connell. Hi, David. Um, David asks, is there a certification that exists for developers to pursue for particular new developments? Developers starting to think about and act in good lighting decisions can perhaps influence cities. Yeah. That's something we're actively looking into. For, for years, um, IJ did have a program called our Development of Distinction program. It hadn't been updated for 12 years, so we kind of put a pause on it at the end of last year. We're currently in the process of evaluating that and determining how we can come up with a, a certification program for developers and developments that will really embody the principles uh, that we've outlined. And we're also in discussion with the, the Illuminating Engineering Society and others about just training. That there's, there's a paucity of training for engineers and architects and planners who are making the decisions about how we light our environment. So that there are some great opportunities, I think, to take these principles and take the, the partnerships that we're developing to really um, have people start to think more critically and more deeply about the ways that we're lighting our world at night. Very good, okay. Well, we're, we're really getting some good questions here, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Um, uh, John Scarangelo asks, how much of a problem are car lights and traffic signals? I haven't seen much what I would call data on this, certainly around traffic, traffic signals. I mean, I think traffic signals fit into the category of we need them for safety. We, we can't, you know, it's only really, there are areas where we just, we need light because of the way that we're moving around at night. I think the question of car lights is a really interesting one. Uh, there was a presentation yesterday um, during Dark Sky Week by Travis Longcore, uh, and he showed um, some images taken out in Dark Sky places of um, trains of light coming up a hill from um, from from car lights moving on roads and it, he was he took the picture to sort of model it this is what a, a large predator would see what a large cat or a large uh, mammal would see uh, and clearly from their perspective that road with all those those lights on it becomes a barrier uh, and not just because of the cars but also because of the, the lit environment um, our, our, we, we suspect um, that it's that that, that you know car lights are a significant issue, particularly with large urban areas. And it'd be interesting to do some studies on certainly in US cities where we have these grid patterns. You can you can imagine going out in distance and starting to measure <laughs> yeah. and starting to look at that. Now it is noticeable. Um, I can add a little bit to that for, for John. You know, we can clearly see from from Mars Hill here in Flagstaff when we look out over the city, uh, you know, the brightest lights we see are, are the headlights principally because of the horizontal propagation, but more quantitatively, um, I, I'm pretty sure my colleague Chris Luganville has, has studied some of the all-night uh, sky brightness measurements, and you can see a decline uh, as you get uh, from 11 to midnight to 1, partly because a curfew kicks in when, when certain signs have to go out, but also, you know, people are going to bed, and there are just not as many cars on the road, and um, I, I think I've heard, I'm pretty sure I've heard Chris say it's a, a noticeable effect. Um, GKC Geoscience, I can't, um, asks, are there data on how changing wavelengths affect night vision for those of us who are <clears throat> aging? I'm sure there are. I'm not a, an expert on this. I, yeah. I was on an exchange recently looking at actually some roadway data. And I know when they're looking at roadway lighting, they're, they're looking at the, the difference in, in between younger, you know, the, the under 18 eyes versus, let's say, the over 55 and over 65 eyes, and, and clearly, as our as as we age, our eyes do change, and our ability to see uh, changes, and particularly the, the short wavelength. I mean, the reason I understand, I'm not the scientist, but the reason the sky is blue is because of Rayleigh scattering, and essentially that is correct. In our eyeball as our, as as we as we age, which is why um, driving at night can become hazardous with all that glare. Right, right. And here's actually a really interesting question from uh, Kelly Hicks. Has there been a noticeable change in this time of quarantine and store closures in the darkness of the sky in urban city centers? I um, got a note from Chris Elvidge at the Colorado School of Mines yesterday addressing just this very issue. He's been doing an analysis of, 
uh, light at night using Nivea's data, comparing, I think the analysis he put out was February to December. Um, and he was looking at a, a, a variety of large uh, conurbations around the world, including Phoenix, um, Paris, London, Delhi, Beijing, Tokyo, uh, 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 and others. And, and the short answer is yes. I mean, the, the, the cities and states and countries that had put a curfew in place uh, saw dramatic reductions, particularly in their central business districts in, in light, and, and maybe some indications of increase in other, in other areas. But places like Phoenix, which in February were not under stay-at-home uh, orders, there was no change. Um, and he is, you know, people are starting to think about using it and, and, uh, as much as a sign of uh, economic recovery mm. as well. And, and, and that that's kind of gives me pause. It's like, we, we want to break this assumption <laughs> uh, that, um, you know, you need to have a lot of light to have a strong economy. Um, there's other data, really interesting data, in terms of how light pollution varies based upon GDP and based upon um, economic uh, economic interests like GDP and population. And the, the good news there is there are some cities and communities that use light very efficiently. Um, yep. So that, that kind of gives us hope. But it's, it's not a given that just because you have a high population and a and a strong economy that you produce excessive light pollution. You know, you clearly will use more light, but you could use it efficiently. So we, we need to break that um, yep. that relationship yep. all the time. Um, and, you know, and clearly there have been, I think to Kelly's question, there have been additional changes too. I mean, you may have seen the past couple of days, there have been images circulating on the internet uh, from satellites showing a, a distinct decline in air pollution. You know, as uh, as activity has declined, and just personally, I mean, just walking back and forth to my home, the the astounding lack of contrails. I mean, you know, the, oh, yeah. the only other time I could think of something like that was immediately post 9/11. And you know, obviously, we have to eventually get the economy back up and running. You know, when it is safe and appropriate to do so. And yeah, it would be good if we can find out ways to to sort of maintain these these new standards as, as we all get back to work. <laughs> the, the other aspect of this that's going to be really interesting to, to look at is as, as the uh, price of oil has collapsed, I, I think it was, was it trading at negative 38 or it, something? It, it something was actually negative, like yeah. Um, some of the brightest sources of light pollution, um, it's only in the U.S., uh, are the shale pits. Yeah. And um, my understanding is, you know, with oil as low as it is, um, it's not economically feasible to recover. Um, so that's we're likely to see a reduction in, in those areas uh, as yeah. well, again, to, driven by the sort of economic engine there. Yep. Well, so, you know, when we, uh, we've got just a couple of pictures to show you, you know, here at Lowell Observatory, we're trying to model good lighting institutionally. Um, at left is our new Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. Um, a little sad to see it shuttered every night these days. It's supposed to be open with lots of people looking at the wonders of the cosmos through it. Um, but, you know, we're trying to, to use our campus as an example. Um, Danielle Adams, who's behind the scenes as we speak, um, monitoring the YouTube feed for us, took that other picture. And then finally, this is um, just from Buffalo Park in Flagstaff. That's Venus over there, low on the horizon, and the Milky Way. Um, right from the center of the city of a 75,000 people. So it can be done, and we certainly encourage everybody to do it. Um, we're almost to the, the end of our usual 45-minute slot. Um, really like to, any, any final comments from you, Ruskin, that you'd like to leave with our viewers? No, I think for us, dark side protection starts at home. There, there are some simple things everyone can do. Um, it starts with awareness, so this week's a great opportunity to get more engaged and more involved in Check out the great presentations at idsw.darksky.org and then take that awareness and move into action. And we really believe that it does start at home. Um, it's as simple as, you know, turn on the light off when, <laughs> <laughs> at midnight, if you don't need it on the porch, again, following our lighting principles, consider getting a home um, self assessed. Um, and then talking with your friends and neighbors about why you care about the sky above and what it means for the the wildlife habitat and some simple things that they can do. Yeah, and they can get a lot of information. If I've got the URL correct, you are darksky.org, correct? 
That's correct, darksky.org, great resources, um, great community to be involved in. Join up and you can become part of a community of advocates um, and lovers of dark skies around the world. We, we have members of every continent. That's Antarctica. right, and you are a, uh, a, a non-profit organization, yeah, so... We're a 501 non-profit, so all contributions are tax deductible. Yes, and that will certainly help the IDA continue the, the excellent work you're doing. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you very much, Ruskin, for your, for your time today. This has been a great conversation. Hope the viewers have enjoyed it. And, you know, do your part to keep, keep, the, keep the skies dark and, and beautiful and a resource for all of us around the world. So until next week, um, uh, next week on Cosmic Coffee, I will be here with Lowell Deputy Director for Science, Michael West, we're going to take a slightly different tack and do a, a powers of 10 survey of the universe. And we're going to start down at quarks and end up 13 billion light years away and just see what sorts of wondrous sights uh, we can see out there, provided we keep our skies nice and dark. So thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Ruskin. And till next week. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Jeff.